Yes, guys. So I hope I'm audible to you. I haven't spoken anything. So I can see your comments right up in okay. YouTube, guys. So I can keep replying. So, but I can only watch the comments only after a point of time where I'm done with a particular paragraph or explaining a particular paragraph on today's standard. So yes, guys. So we are going live from now on. So we will be doing continuous live sessions on YouTube or even on tuition. .in. Tuition. .in is giving enormous amount of support in making sure that the classes are going uninterrupted to all the students. So our basic intention is to make sure that this time that we have where I am also free, I am absolutely free and where students are also absolutely doing nothing at home and just preparing. So we can provide some additional support to the students for those who are writing either in this June probably, okay, because some of them are still confused whether the exams will be conducted in June. So let us be prepared that the tentative timetable which ICA has given. So let us assume that the timetable is perfectly fine because you have more than 8 weeks of time to go for your exams to come in so let's assume that the eight weeks of time is more than sufficient for you to complete preparation and even for those people who are going to write in november or even the subsequent attempts in 2021 so these classes are basically going to provide you the sessions in an interactive manner how is it interactive when you can't speak to me very well you can comment on youtube i will definitely be reading each and every comment provided they make some sense no good mornings no highs and all so please make sure that it is content related. Yes, we have informal conversations in between. Absolutely fine. We don't have a problem with that. Just but keep trying to you know, at least keep the things more objective. Right. So today our session is predominantly based on India's 116. It's a direct copy paste of IFRS 16 there's no additions or deletions from IFRS 16 guys IFRS 15 was basically dealing with revenue recognition so now we are dealing with IFRS 16 so this IFRS 16 or India 16 which has come in is basically replacing Our earlier standard on India's, that is India's 17 or it was IAS 17. Now, grave necessity man. As we progress by as attempts keep passing by, new standards are keeping on, you know, coping up or approaching us. Observe the last attempt in 2019, all those people who have written the exam, they were not having IFRS 16 or India's 116 in their syllabus. But look at you guys who are writing in 2020 or 2021. IFRS 16 is already there and already in application and right now is also necessary for you to be trained and for your exam purposes. Educational material on IFRS 16 and IA India 16, 116 have been already released by ICA. So you need to understand that as attempts progress by then the standards will keep on developing in its form. So one thing we have to be really uh, grateful is we are trying to basically include more and more uh, newer generation transactions into the scope of India's or into the scope of IFRS now. Now earlier reporting was in a different format and today's the reporting is a completely different format. Now where have we seen new standards come up? I think 2009 we got 30, 31, 32 and immediately in 2012 it was withdrawn. 2015 came in with India's with 41 standards and out of which few of them were relaxed. And then from there on, if you keep on observing your India's 115 came in, 116 comes in and now 117 is already in the state of taking some guidances apart. So if you look at, we are evolving in its form. Yes, one thing which every student will claim is, sir, as I keep progressing with the attempts, I think I'm trying to read more and more than what I was doing in the previous attempt. Now that is a common scenario, but one thing let me tell you, even if you were qualified at this point of time, you should be having sufficient knowledge on the latest updates. Be it on reporting, be it on GSTs, be it on income tax. One has to keep themselves updated. That is what every person looking at a chartered accountant normally expects. Now suddenly someone comes up to me and says that since you are a chartered accountant, tell me what is a tax planning. I tell them, no, no, I am not my tax partner. There's another tax partner of mine who can help you. Then the first question they'll ask, are you a CEO or not? 
because according to them ca basically does everything does gst does income tax does uh, fema does company law everything he does there is nothing that he does not do which, which is not right but at the same time i think every child accountant even though he is qualified should be updated with the kind of knowledge that he has even though i am not into gst i'll try to keep myself updated on what is happening around gst i'll try to keep myself updated with the income tax law that is because people do expect from us and it is not always necessary that you have to keep on depending on your partner's word so this ifrs 16 basically or india is 116 i can say is with effect from comes in with effect from 1st april 2020 onwards actually it is 2019 but i am keeping it as 2020 because that is when we will be drafting our first set of financial statements so i'll take it as 1st april 2020 or you can take it as 1st april 2019 this is the date on which this standard actually comes into application now whenever we are talking about this standard coming into application then what is it so different from what it had before under india 70 india 17 was also talking about leases and even now your ifrs 11 ifrs 16 or india 116 is also talking about leases what is such significant differences that you will find out here now the significant difference or the reason why india 116 was necessary at this point of time to be implemented or to be brought into picture is because of certain things which were missing in india 17 now i'll say sir i thought it was a very comprehensive standard and earlier when i heard about india 17 it looked quite comprehensive enough what did it leave out of it left out on a certain presentation requirements which were necessary under operating leases now whenever i talk about this operating lease concept i think most of you remember either you are accounting standard 19 as 19 which did talk about leases or even if you remember india 17 both of them had a very similar accounting treatment for operating leases where it says where it says that basically uh, where it says that every operating lease a lessee has to recognize the amount paid under operating lease as an expense and every lessor will recognize the amount paid under operating lease as a income and whenever it was done it was done over a period of time on a straight line basis is what it says that means there is no recognition of an asset there is no recognition of a liability but unfortunate problem is there are certain companies like airline uh, you know flying services which are basically operating on passenger airlines where majority of the airlines were basically leased out where the entire machinery or the flight which we you we call it in colloquial terms is basically that aircraft is a leased vehicle and that leased vehicle is basically being on a operating lease therefore if you remember under ratio analysis we had a very critical ratio called as return on fixed assets now that return on fixed assets when i start taking out a return on fixed assets for indigo airlines or spicejet it becomes very difficult because such kind of assets are never presented in the balance sheet at all now if you ask them sir indigo and spicejet does not have an aircraft as a property plan and equipment yes it they do not have because they don't own anything all those aircrafts are basically run on leases and majority of them being operating leases when it becomes an operating lease the asset is not recognized but the income from the asset is recorded so what about your return on fixed assets the entire logic of giving your ratios is basically going for a toss when the representation formats are not appropriate that is the particular reason why this standard becomes applicable now now why did i write 2019 or 2020 i'll come back to that logic when i'm talking about transitional requirements i'm not going to talk about it right now now this session we will start with the scope of the standard trying to talk about the exclusions from the scope of the standard or what are certain leases which fall outside the scope of the standard and from there on we will start looking at what contains a lease when do you say a contract is or when there is a contract contain a lease that is something that we have to look at if we would have gone with in day 17 we also had appendix a b or c 
there are three appendix which are attached to in the 17 which are no longer applicable now but these three appendix are now forming part of the scope of the standard itself within the standard itself they have embedded or included all this appendix now what is this appendix basically now is obviously everything goes on an improvement mode okay immediately when you implement a standard doesn't mean that the standard is 100% set there might be certain things in the standard which can go missing sometimes certain paragraphs in the standard are not uh, you know sufficient enough to explain what the standard is now sometimes there does happen something like this one of the very important standard or very easy standard for you to remember was your accounting standard 16 or your indes 23 when we talk about borrowing cost when we discuss about borrowing cost there is a very important term called as qualifying asset which comes in. when they start discussing about qualifying asset there comes a word called a substantial period of time what is substantial now nowhere in the standard either under a 16 or under indes 23 the standard ever described what is substantial period of time so there came in an accounting standard interpretation asi asi 1 came out and said that substantial period of time is a period for 12 months or more or i would say something like this as not shorter than 12 months can be considered as substantial period of time so these are additional explanations to the standard to make the standard more holistic so appendix is also very similar to that where it starts discussing about certain aspects which were not dealt in the standard or will start explaining certain aspects of the standard which are not clearly presented in the standard so very simple long language but in the ifrs or under ias they call them as ifrics ifrics is basically what they use we call it by a word called as appendix how we have changed ifrs to indes we have changed ifrics to appendix there is a common terminology or colloquial language that we keep using up and down now should i remember appendix a b c in order at all necessary because your india 17 is no longer there then even your appendix a b c has also been eliminated from your uh, you know the scope of the standard so what does the standard even talk about first of all does the standard even have anything to discuss about now whenever i discuss about the standard guys you can uh, keep sending us any comments i'll keep replying can i view the stream afterwards no come on yeah you can view the stream afterwards because that even the recorded session will be posted no issues regarding that but try to make sure that you are going live because it will be more interactive now as we go about now we we'll start understanding a little bit of concepts regarding what is the scope of the standard so when i go with the scope of the standard first you need to understand what is a lease what is a lease basically there are two parties one party whom i call it as a lessor and the other party whom i call him as less the lessor is the owner of the asset and the owner of the asset normally transfers right to control use of the asset in return the lessee compensates to the lessor by paying some consideration and this consideration which we commonly know as lease payments you can call them as periodic lease payments because there are series of lease payments which are made over the period over the term of the lease so you can call them as periodic lease payments as well yeah so predominantly the standard will be a very very simple standard to understand and discuss should take not more than 2 and a half hours for us to completely round up the standard okay so where it uses a logics of as19 
I will try to go about in a little bit faster pace where new aspects are being dealt with. I will start going a little bit slow. Now, what does the standard basically include? The scope of the standard, it includes all leases. There is no exclusion for any particular lease except a few which are anyways covered under other standards. They are normally getting covered under other standards. So that is the reason why they normally get excluded from the scope of your India's uh, 116. Now, what are those exceptions? The first exception I'll talk about is lease of mineral ores natural gas mines etc there's a separate standard to deal with this so i'm not going to involve into this now number 2 lease of leases related to agriculture dealt under india's 41 specifically so we don't have to involve ourselves into this leases relating to service concession agreements what are service concession agreements they basically dealt under india's 115 to explain in brief about service concession agreements i can put it up very simple sense uh, you can take a toll road, JMR or someone else will lay a road or LNT lays a road. They are entitled to collect toll charges from us for a particular period of time, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years of lease. Now airports are basically under service concession agreements because whenever you take off from Hyderabad airport or land at Hyderabad airport, JMR collects 300 rupees as convenience charges. Now that is basically nothing but a part of service concession agreement. Because the airport belongs to the airport authority, but since it is being constructed or the entire infrastructure is being, being taken up by a private party, the private party has a right to collect a particular amount or a prescribed amount which the government nominates. The government nominally nominates a particular amount which can they get entitled to collect. So such kind of contracts are coming under service concession agreements. They are dealt under India's 115 in depth. So I'll leave it there. Leases relating to intangible assets, like I can talk about motion pictures, patents. Copyrights, etc. All these are your intangible asset, but remember this is optional. Why is it optional? Because it is covered under another standard that is India's 38. So if you want to deal it as per India's 38, you can very well deal with it under India's 38. If you want to deal it under India's 116, you can take it under India's 116. These are completely rights which are optional at the option of the enterprise. Either you can choose to deal it under India's 116 or you can choose to deal it under India's 38. These are simple exclusions from the scope of the standard. Now, if anyone has a doubt, you can go ahead as far as this is concerned or leases. Now let's try to progress from here on if you do not have any doubts. 
guys we have close to 80 people who are already streaming which is really fantastic keep it going guys try to keep your friends also notified that the stream has started you people they can log in at any point of time if they have missed something then you can help them or anyways the recorded video will be available so ask them to please make sure that they subscribe anyways going forward to it now there are certain exceptions as far as the recognition is concerned so that means a certain leases need not be recognized at all now why do you say that certain leases need not be recognized dude as simple as that they are not material enough when they are not material enough what is the point of recognizing such kind of leases for example let's say the lease period is less than 12 months such a short period of time now before the end of the financial year you will only find that only a few months of lease is still unexpired now for such kind of short term leases is it necessary for us to do an entire exercise of dealing with india's 116 is the question i'm sorry guys this is popped in for some reason yeah so is it necessary for us to basically deal with the entire uh, logic of india's 116 for such short term leases the second thing which i can talk about is leases for items which are of low value small value items the item itself is so immaterial. I am talking about a company of a big size having a turnover of almost close to Reliance, lakhs of crores. Man. Okay, Reliance numbers are always very, uh, you know, astonishing because they reported turnovers of 4 lakh crores. I know crores has 7 zeros, that much I have. I have a knowledge on 4 lakh crores, how many zeros is a very difficult logic to me. So 4.5 lakh crores of a company, then if I talk about a lease of a car which is basically used to transporting the employees to office then it becomes a too small a number for me to report too small a number for me to apply india's 116 on it because a car in its value itself is less than 5 lakhs in its fair value if it is less than 5 lakhs now does it even make sense when i am reporting numbers which are rounded up in crores I have rounded up numbers in crores does it make even a practical logic if I start reporting such small leases very difficult that is the reason why keeping in mind the materiality concept these kind of recognition exemptions are also provided exemption from recognition so you don't have to recognize these items at all now what are these items which need not be recognized at all like i told you there are two items number one is short term leases and second one leases for which the underlying asset is of low value What is low value is also explained as far as the standard is concerned. Yes, you can apply materiality, that is what he said. But what is low value? When do I say that the items have a very low value? So I can say that underlying assets are of low value underlying assets are of low value if now i'll bring up some terminology which you can relate to in your india's 115 terminology is very similar i'll bring back to you what is the paragraph in india's 115 where the terminology is so similar language used out here is the lessee the person who has taken that asset on lease 
can benefit from the use of underlying asset by itself or together with other assets which are readily available second point the underlying asset is not highly dependent or interrelated observe the language which is used out here underlying assets are of low value if the lessee can take a benefit from the use of underlying assets uh, asset on its own by itself that means he need not depend on any other asset to take a benefit he gets the benefit of using the asset by itself for example i am having an asset like a ac air conditioner which is taken on lease an air conditioner taken on lease once it is established or set up installed i can take the benefit of the asset by itself i need not apply some other assets together with it to basically extract some benefit out of it. So that is when I say that the underlying asset is giving me a benefit on its own. I'm not depending on any other asset to give me a benefit for itself. Or together with assets which are readily available. Now what is this readily available? Readily available means nothing but an asset which either I already own or I can procure it from market. Now, for example, I have an AC, then someone will come up and say, sir, you can have an AC and the asset can, uh, AC can give you a benefit only if you have electricity connection. Yes, absolutely correct. It is already which I have electricity connection or even if I don't have, it doesn't take much of an effort to get electricity connection into my house. Therefore, in such situation, I will say that the asset can give a benefit by itself or it can give a benefit with other resources which are readily available with the enterprise. Clear? Now, what is the second point? The underlying asset is not highly dependent or interrelated. What does it mean? That means the dependence or interrelationship with other assets in the organization is very low. It is very similar or related to what the first point is. It is saying that when you can get a benefit by itself, that means it is not customizable with other assets. It is not highly related to or integrated with other assets. For example, let's say I have taken a lease of a small part of an equipment. Now that part of an equipment can only give me a benefit once it is installed on the part. If it is not installed on the part, then it is not possible for me to take a benefit. That means there is a high level of integration which is necessary for the component which is leased out and with other asset that is the equipment which I already have. Therefore, in such situation, I will say I cannot consider such kind of leases as lease having a low value. Now, I told you that these two points are something that we have already seen. Now, where did we come across these points? These points we have come across under India's 115. Under India's 115, when we talk about, if someone has already got it, you can please type in the comments. What is your answer for it? Under India is 115. I have given you one very, very clear uh, this thing, I guess. Now you tell me. Under India is 115. Where did we see this terminology? This terminology we have seen when we wanted to identify or define what are 
distinct groups and services. When we wanted to define what is a distinct good or a service, this is there under performance obligations. I am also specifying the step under which we come across these words. Step 2 under India's 1 and 5 is identifying performance obligations in a contract. Under performance obligations in a contract, performance obligation is a promise to deliver distinct goods and service or a series of distinct goods and services which are substantially the same and have a same amount of benefit to the customer. So this is the same language which is used under India's 115 under distinct goods where he says that the customer can take a benefit of the good by itself or together with other goods which are readily available to him and the good is not highly dependent or related interrelated with other goods and services then in such cases you can call them as distinct goods and services and can be identified as a separate performance obligation. Yes, Yamuna gets it. Yamuna has answered it right. It is distinct goods and services. This word is what we were specifying about. Now, moving on from there, where we were talking about underlying assets having a low value and short term leases. Now, when I said, if you remember, we started here where we were talking about exemptions from recognition and we were talking about short term lease. What do you mean by short term lease? Now immediately when I use the word short term, someone might have already got in your mind anything which is within 12 months will be called as less than or equal to 12 months can be called as a short term lease as simple as that. This is not a very typical definition I guess majority of the places wherever we use the word short term it predominantly means 12 months. So again I'll put it across the same thing. It is 12 months from commencement of lease. Don't calculate it from the end of the financial year. It should be from the commencement of lease. Because someone might have taken an 18 months lease on 1st October. You go in to do the audit on 31st March and he'll say sir the lease period is less than 12 months. So this is a short term lease. Not possible. Because your 12 months is supposed to be calculated from the day on which the lease commences. So that is very very important for us under understanding what is a short term lease. Now one more thing which I wanted to tell you is... The first exemption, the first recognition exemption regarding short term leases. Short term lease exemption should be consistently applied. That means what? One lease which is short term lease, I ignored it saying that I'll take the recognition exemption. Another lease which is a short term but I wanted to recognize the asset which is not possible. Once it is taken as a, a particular stand, you have to consistently apply to all short term leases under that. But however, when I'm talking about low value underlying asset, If I'm talking about this kind of exemption where I'm talking about low value of underlying asset, in these cases we can apply it on case to case basis. So both are not the same. So short term leases should be consistently applied. If you have taken an exemption for short term leases, then you can continue to go upon and take the exemption on a consistent basis to all leases which are within a period of 12 months. If you have recognized one short term lease, you have not opted for the exemption at all, then you have to make sure that every short term lease is recognized upon. Selective relaxation or selective exemptions are not possible. You have to consistently apply. But low value exemption for low value underlying asset exemption for leases, in such case you can go on case to case basis. Certain leases you can take an exemption, 
certain leases you can start recognizing them even though they consider to be of low value clear now that we understood that we are just talking about what are the inclusions and exclusions in scope we haven't gone too much we have just done exclusions from the scope of the standing and we have just done exemptions from recognition that's it we haven't done much far about it from there now comes in the question is the standard so different Sir, I'm not live. What level am I going to stream? Live, okay. Live, okay. Okay, sir, show me. Yes. Ah, in the full position, sir. Yes, 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 sir. अच्छे से रख सारे ये क्लोज है लाइफ फिनिशिंग ये रनी लाइफ फिनिशिंग आधे इन द क्लोज है ना इन द क्लोज है ना दंग आट लग रही शुरू में रनिंग ना था ले रहे थे पावर इंट्रक्शन है तेरे स्ट्रीम इस तो रनिंग स्ट्रीम है तो प्रॉब्लम है ना सर मैं कहनी है एनी डेज की बना मैं कुछ सर सर एनी डेज की बना मंटा रहा है 
రాసుకోండి స్ట్రీమ్ డెస్క్ కి I think we went offline guys for some reason I have no idea what was the reason I'm really sorry about that I don't know why it went offline and I can't even see your comments as well it still says live stream is offline Just give me a second I think we are back live. I think I can see. Yeah, I think we are going. Uh, just let me know if there is any other trouble that you are getting because I I see that the stream is already live. I was just checking if the video is live or not. I think it is live. Yeah, Krishnaru, I think it is live. Yeah, okay, sir. A small technical glitch and nothing else. Uh, was a small technical glitch and nothing else. So let's go on. So if you observe, guys, so what we were talking about. let me see where we are basically when we are talking about this scheme of things Yes, guys, I can see your comments as well. No problem. So we were talking about exemptions. So now let's discuss about why is this standard coming up and how is it so different from our India 17. When India 17 was implemented, when it was handling it well, like I told you, India 116 is a development upon. It start giving you a new dimension only to the concept of operating leases. Whatever we had in finance lease will stay as it is. and more importantly let me tell you if i compare between india 17 and if i go on comparison with your india 116 i'll basically split them into four parts okay one is operating lease and the other one is finance lease these are the only two leases that we had even now also we have only two leases and of which we did talk about lessor and lessee accounting even here also we did discuss about under finance lease lessor and lessee account under indias 116 if i am talking about the comparison i would still have the same accounting treatment 
whatever I had for finance lease, there's no change. And even for operating lease to the extent of lessor, I will preserve my treatment. The only place I'm gonna make a change is lessee's account. This is the only difference which comes up. Where the difference will talk about something called as R-O-U-S-X. -S. The remaining things are absolutely the same. The entire books of lessor, books of lessor, same. Lessee's accounting for finance lease, lessee's accounting for finance lease, same. The only difference which is coming up is lessee's accounting for operating lease under India 17 and 116. Where India 116 will start talking about what is an ROU asset. ROU is nothing but right of use asset. You have never seen this terminology earlier under any other standard. So I am bringing out a new classification within the definition or within your balance sheet itself. Right on the face of the balance sheet from now on with the first balance sheet being done on 31st March 2020, we will start looking at what is this right of use assets. This right of use assets will emerge out of nowhere and will start making some sense now. Because right on the face of the balance sheet, you will find ROU assets, ROU machinery, ROU furniture, which is distinct from the assets which I own, but they are still assets. What I own is basically presented under property plan and equipment. ROU assets are also presented under property plan and equipment, but as a distinct specific item. That is basically the only logic that I'm gonna discuss as far as the standard is concerned. So throughout the standard, keep your head very, very clear that now whatever India is 116 I'm learning, the only different part other than what I had in AS19, your AS19 or your India's 117, uh, both were basically the same. There's no great difference between both of them as far as their recognition is concerned. So lessor accounting treatment, I am not going to see any difference. Lessee's accounting treatment under finance lease, I'm not going to see any difference. But lessee's accounting under operating lease, I will start looking at a new word called as right of use assets. Now, let's start discussing that. Now, first of all, the first thing that I have to do is I'll have to identify a lease. Now, first of all, what is a non? What is a lease? A contract is or a contract contains a lease only if it transfers a right to control the use of the asset to the lessee in exchange for consideration. I said a contract is a lease or contains a lease if it conveys right to control the use of asset right to control the use of asset to the lessee. In exchange for, what do you exchange for? Nothing but consideration. That is nothing but your periodic lease rentals. So I am looking at this. When do I say I control the use of this? I control the use of identifiable asset. Now, identification of lease, you are again talking about identification of
controlling the asset. Now let's start looking at. It. Yes, guys. So when we are talking about identifying the lease, so basically a lease a contract contains a lease if it conveys a right to control the use of an asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. Now, first of all, what are the necessary components of a lease? So when do I say a contract contains a lease, and what are the necessary criteria for? The first criteria is there should be an identifiable asset. Without an identifiable asset, you can never call it as a lease. Criteria number one identifiable asset. When do you call something as an identifiable asset? Are all assets identifiable? I'll come to that once. Relax. Number two. Second thing is the customer or in lease terms we call them as lessee has a right to obtain has a right to obtain substantially all the economic benefits from use of a set. throughout the period clear number three the customer or the lessee has a right to direct how and what purpose the asset is being used. These are the three parts. First one, you identify the asset. There should be an identifiable asset to call it as a lease. Number two, the lessee or the customer, whoever is taking the lease, uh, asset on lease, has a right to obtain substantially all the economic benefits which are arising from the use of the asset throughout the period of the lease. The customer or the lessee has a right to direct, I have a right to direct, on how the asset will be used and for what purpose the asset will be used. If these three conditions are satisfied, you can definitely say that that contract does contain a lease. Now sometimes there happens to be a situation. I'll bring in the concept of Appendix B which we had earlier under India 70. Yes, I did say that it is not relevant for you to remember, but I'm just bringing up arrangements which can contain a lease. I was doing Indies for a particular power manufacturing company in Hyderabad which was into supplying windmills. Their logic is very simple. They manufacture or construct a windmill. They erect it directly at the customer's premises. So let's say there is Tata Power. Uh, the Tata has, uh, sorry, uh, let's say Tata Steel is there. So Tata Steel has a particular manufacturing plant. I'm taking for an example. So my windmill, which I manufacture in my godown, I will directly go and install it in Tata Steel's premises. And I have an agreement to say that as long as the windmill is erected in your place, let's say the agreement is for 15 years, 
throughout the period of 15 years, the amount of electricity which is generated by such windmill which is established or erected in your godown, the entire power generated will be only supplied to Tata Steel. I will not have a right to supply it to anyone else. There is the matter. Now, if such is an arrangement, and let's say Tata Steel says, fine then, whatever power is being generated, I will make sure that I will compensate you by paying 15 rupees per unit of power produced. Now you tell me, did I sell power or does it have anything called as lease? Very, very fantastic question. Very fantastic question. Because by the base of the document, if I look at or if, the, if I look at the invoice which this company raises, it says so and so number of units of power supplied multiplied by rate per unit, total value of invoice and they will give it to the customer. If I look at the face of the invoice, there is nothing for me to believe that there is a lease in it. But if I read the agreement carefully, there I understand this arrangement is in a situation where it is the customer who has a right to use the asset. No one else has a right to use the asset. The windmill is generating power. That power will be consumed by Tata Steel. No one else. It is erected in his premises only. The asset is identifiable. I can see it right in front of me. In such cases, though the arrangement does not look to be having a lease, neither it terms anywhere that it is a lease, but still it contains a lease. It is a lease of the equipment where substantially all the benefits, all the economic benefits which are generated from the use of the windmill are being consumed by the lessee or the customer. Therefore, it 100% contains lease. That's why I said the appendix ABC which was earlier given as an annexure to India 17 are now included as a part of the standard itself. Clear? Now, there are certain things or certain exemptions when we talk about right to direct how to use it. So this is basically right to control the use of the asset. Right to control use of asset that we have already discussed even in the definition. Control the right to control the use of the asset. So this is basically the third point is basically talking about the same logic. Let's come back. First of all, when do I say that an asset is identified in a contract or a contract identifies an asset? How do I know that a, an asset is identified in a contract? Identified assets in contract. What is an identified asset in a contract and how do I identify an asset in a contract? Very simple logic. When the supplier has no substantial substitution right when the supplier has no substantial substitution rights then you can say that the asset is identified in a contract such asset can either be expressed in a contract or can be implied in a contract. Sometimes I can say that this is the asset in the contract itself. Sometimes the contract may not identify the asset expressly, but it is implying that there is this is the asset which I am directing or indicating towards. So I can identify the asset. Now for me to identify the asset in a contract, their supplier should never have the supplier's name. We can also give them another name. It is nothing but my lessor. My lessor or the supplier does not have a substantial substitution right. Now what do you mean by the substantial substitution right and where does this come from? 
Now the substantial substitution right means the supplier or the lessor cannot replace the asset with another asset. It is not possible for the supplier to basically replace the asset with another asset. Then we have we say that the supplier or the lessor does not have a substantial substitution right. Second thing along with that the supplier will not be benefiting economically if he undergoes a substitution. I will put, put it up. If I write it, it makes more sense. There are two points here. The supplier's substitution right is substantive. substitution right is substantive when is it substantive it is substantive if point number one first point The supplier has a practical ability to substitute alternative asset alternative asset and I am again very clearly separating it with the word and second point supplier would economically benefit from exercise of substitution right. Okay, so I am saying that the supplier should not have a substantial substitution right. What is a substantial substitution right? Supplier has a substantial substitution right if they, he has a practical ability to substitute another asset. For example, the same example which I have given you, the power manufacturing company has set up or erected a windmill plant in the premises of Tata Steel. Tata Steel never specified this. I never said this particular windmill, which I see right in front of me, this is the asset which I want it to be. I never said. I said you erect any windmill out here, no problem. That power, whatever it produces, I will consume. If I said so, then I am saying that the supplier has a right to remove that windmill, to replace it with one more windmill and keep using it for the same purpose and still the lease contract or the contract which contains the lease is being satisfied along with it and I said and I said I said such substitution such decommissioning of the existing one and replacing it with an alternative asset is economically beneficial to the supplier what does it mean now now it makes a lot of sense most of the companies may not specify the asset in the contract. They may not. They might not really say that this asset with, uh, you know, I might say, I want a lease of a vehicle man. Okay. And what vehicle, sir? I want a lease of a particular Tata Indica. Okay. I want a lease of Tata Indica is what I said. Okay. It's been already used for my purpose. Now, in the contract, I never said 
I am implying towards or expressing towards a Tata Indica which has a number plate of 440, 4404. I never said that. I never really expressly talk about what is the vehicle. That means one day the supplier can give me one vehicle. Next day he can give me a different vehicle as long as it is Tata Indica, as simple as that. Then I will say the supplier has a substantial substitution rate. But now the question comes in. By substituting that particular vehicle, by substituting that particular asset, by exercising the substitution right, does the supplier get any economic benefit? If your answer is no. Sir, if I send this indica also same thing or that indica also same thing, I have 50 indicas. If I send any of them, it is not going to make any economic benefit to me. I basically send the vehicle upon its availability. Whatever is available, I'll ask him to take that particular vehicle. There is no economic benefit which I am deriving by exercising the substitution right. By sending this particular innova, instead of sending that innova, did I get a benefit? And I did not get a benefit. Then there is no point of saying that the substitution right is substantive. Clear? Sometimes there is no practical ability only man. Now, like the case which I have given you regarding the windmill man, 15 years lease rule and windmill is not a small structure, okay? Each blade of windmill is being, being taken on each trailer, each blade. So, imagine how big a windmill is. Now, that windmill, if I have to substitute with one more windmill, think about the transportation cost which I will involve. It is absolutely unnecessary. Why would someone spend so much of money? Therefore, such kind of substitution rights are not substantive. If they are not substantive, then I can identify the asset in the contract as simple as that. Now, just keep looking into it. I will start taking the comments, guys. Yeah, I went online. Okay, now came back. <laughs> Is it on? Any doubts, man? Keep it pouring. Keep pouring the comments, man. Keep pouring the comments. Yes, guys, I'm waiting for any doubt so far. Okay, if we can move forward from here on, let's move on. Now, sometimes there can be a point which, uh, which can say that, can I lease out a portion of an asset? I have a particular building which is of four floors. Can I lease out a portion of that particular asset which is completely as one single building? I have it in, as a supplier. I recognize it as one single asset called as building. Can I divide it into parts or can I divide it into portions and I can I lease them? That is one more. Lease of portion of assets. I can lease out a portion of an asset if it is physically distinct. Now why did I say physically distinct? Each floor of that particular building are physically distinct from each other. Absolutely no problem. 
let's say for example i have an optical fiber cable this is an example which is given in the standard okay i'm using the same one i have an optical fiber cable it can transport close to 1 gbps of data 1 gigabyte per second i had five companies who have taken totally 200 mbps 200 mbps 200 mbps one. it's a shared amount of the same optical fiber cable or same unit now can someone tell me can i physically distinguish it is it physically distinct absolutely no it is the same fiber cable i am basically putting a threshold limit for how much amount of data can each particular customer or each lessee can use when it is not physically distinct then you cannot say that the asset can be identified in a lease if it is not physically distinct then you cannot call it as a lease arrangement at all clear now we will start looking at what is this right to obtain economic benefits from use of asset if you observe right at the beginning when i was talking about leases i said identifiable asset yes you have to identify the asset where i said there is no substantial substitution right to the seller or the supplier then i can identify the asset and if a portion of an asset can be identified as an asset if it is physically distinct these are things which you have learnt as a part of first one second one right to obtain economic benefits from the use of the asset throughout the period very good when do you say right to economic benefits when do i have right to economic benefits in that sense i can put it up like this when i say substantially all substantially all economic benefits my meaning of substantially all economic benefits means economic benefits which is a primary output it is a primary output of the asset or it can be any byproducts in the process of manufacture of the process any other benefits arising from the use of this substantially all means the primary output from the use of this byproducts from the process of the asset or any other benefits arising from the asset all these benefits should accrue or should be consumed only by the buyer or the lessee in such case i will say that the, sub, the lessee has obtained substantially all the economic benefits arising from the use of that particular asset now someone will say i'll put it like this I took a lease of a car. The lessor gave me a restriction saying that I can only use the car in the within the same city and I cannot take the car outside the city. Now you cannot say the car would have produced greater economic benefits had the car moved outside. Therefore, the lessee is not consuming all the economic benefits from the use of the asset. Absolutely not. I cannot say that. If I am using the majority of economic benefits, depending upon the logics or depending upon the restrictions which are placed by the lessor, then I can call myself as a lessee and if the contract can be called as a lease. For example, a machine was taken on lease and the lessor put a criteria saying that the lease, the asset should only, should not be used for more than 8 hours during a day. 
Now, any man with common sense would say the, list, the machine would have given a greater benefit had it been used for three shifts throughout 24 hours. Agreed, I agree. So, you are using only eight hours. Therefore, you are only using one third of the total economic benefits that, which the asset can derive. Therefore, it is not substantially all the economic benefit. Argument, absolute nonsense. Because the seller or the supplier has put a restriction saying that the asset can be used only for eight hours in a day. So when I am using or consuming majority of that eight hours, that means I have consumed majority of economic benefits. You cannot contend saying that the asset can be used for furthermore period. You did not use it. The seller has put a criteria for it. Therefore, such kind of situations can be completely ignored. Okay? These both situations or these both criteria have been given as far as the standard itself. I am not talking about something which I have invented all of a sudden, but these are things which are already given as a part of the standard. Clear? What was the thing? First one was identifiable asset. Second one was substantially all the economic benefits should be consumed. And let's come to the third one. Should direct on how and for what purpose the asset is used. This is basically called as customer has a right to direct the use of asset I can establish based on three criteria yes guys any doubt so far I'll just check the comment section. Whether a technical upgrade is a substitution right. A technical upgrade is not supposed to be considered as, an, as a substitution right because uh, I think it's a good question which Abhirami asked. Let's say for example, the supplier comes out to basically give you a new asset and says that 
this is 100% a better asset than what is already installed in the premises. If that is the situation and there is no change in the contract terms at all, I would still not consider it as a substitution right because it is not economically beneficial to the supplier. If you observe what I have already given you, I said it would be a substitution right if first of all the supplier can yeah, introduce a substitution that means is it practically possible for someone to substitute the asset and number two I said and the condition coming out there whether it is economically beneficial. No, sometimes there can be a possibility where it becomes economically beneficial to substitute it then I would say that there is a substantial substitution right and it cannot be considered as a lease contract at all. I hope Abhimani that was clear. Sorry, I think there was a technical trouble even back about two minutes back. We are back online, no problem. Yes, guys, I will take a break for 10 minutes. After this, we are done with this right to direct the use of the asset. This is another concept of uh, 10 to 15 minutes that we will go up to. Now, what do you, when do you say that a customer or very clearly, again, I have to use this word before you people get confused. Customer is no one other than lessee man. Supplier is a lessor, customer is a lessee. Lessee has a right to direct the use of the asset. When do I say that a supplier has a right to direct the use of the asset? Number one, the customer can direct how and for what purpose the asset is used this is the first thing that means I can if I want to use it on how I want to use it and for what purpose I want to use it it is customers choice I have given him the asset. It is his wish on how he will use it and for what purpose he will use it. So in such situation, I will say the customer has a right to direct the use of the asset. Second, the customer has a right to operate the asset. He has a right to operate the asset as per the instruction of supplier supplier gave me a restriction saying that I cannot use the asset for more than 8 hours so I can operate the asset however I want throughout the period of 8 hours. So as per the instruction of the supplier, but again I'll put in a condition. Without the supplier, having a right to change. the instructions first day he'll come up and say that the instruction is basically you have to use the asset only for eight hours then again he'll come back to say that you know you have to use the eight hours only from night 12 to morning 8 it is not possible if i put up to all those conditions so you give me some instruction based on which i will use the asset how i'll use it what i'll use it it is my wish you have no right to come back and change the instruction which you have already given you told me to use the asset for 8 hours, I use it for only 8 hours in a day and what 8 hours in a day that I will decide. You will not come up to say no, no, it should be 12 to 8, you can't change it. So once you have given me an instruction, I will follow those instructions and make sure that I use the asset throughout that period. Number 3. The customer designed the asset with a predetermines of how and for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period. Though the supplier has given it, 
asset was designed by the customer asset is designed by the customer with a predetermination you already had in mind on how and for what purpose the asset will be used There are three points which I discussed on when do you say the customer has a right to direct the use of the asset. Right to control the use of the asset. When do I say I can direct how I use the asset for what purpose I use the asset. I have a right to operate the asset. I have a right to operate the asset as per the instructions of the supplier. I am abiding by the instructions of the supplier and I am using the asset. But how I use the asset, my wish. Supplier will not come back to change any instruction. He does not have a right to change the instructions. Number three, the asset I only design. I told him what asset he has to give. There's a fantastic company which was earlier called as Alexandria, now called as MN Group. What they do is they create research labs for pharma companies. Now, pharma companies which are into scientific research they have to basically have certain equipment to do their research. Now this equipment is definitely not cheap. Comes for a very big price. So they give the order to this particular company called as Alexandria or MN. It's a Hyderabad based company. Actually a foreign company which is in Hyderabad. So Alexandria or MN basically designs the entire premises including the equipment according to what the customer wanted it to be. And then it is leased out to the customer. Now, if you say that the asset can be used by the customer, obviously should be used only by the customer because it was designed by the customer. He has based or predetermination of how he has to use the asset. He has designed the asset so like. Therefore, in such cases, I would say that the customer has every right to control the use of the asset. Clear? Now, sometimes a contract can have both a lease component and a non-lease component. Like, let's say, I have undertaken a, 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 an AC. An AC was taken on lease. And uh, when the AC was taken on lease, he said that I will basically do the maintenance for the AC at least once every week. Oh, sorry, at, le at least once every month. So the maintenance of the AC every month is basically a determination of what he's talking about to say that it is a combination of an AC given on lease. In addition to that, a service of, you know, a service which is integrated to it to service the AC on each monthly basis. So what am I basically talking about here? I'm basically talking about things here where I'm here to say that there is a lease component for the AC. There is a service component which is distinguished from the lease. It has to be separated from the lease. You cannot say that both are the same parts. So whenever you are talking about such kind of situations, what do we have to do? Now separation of a lease and a non-lease component should compulsorily be done. Wherever it is practical. If it is not practical, then you have to treat the entire component as a lease contract itself. Sometimes I can have a lease plus non-lease, both together. Just to give an example, I can have a lease of a machinery for a period of time 
and a non-lease contract can be operation and maintenance of the machine. If both these components are forming part of a single contract, they are parts of a single contract, lease of machinery, operation and maintenance of machinery are a single contract. Then it includes a lease and a non-lease components. So the contract consideration The consideration of contract should be split between lease component and non-lease component based on something called as in the proportion of stand alone selling prices. So the total contract consideration is let's say 100. That 100, I would say if it was lease alone, without operation and maintenance, if I would have taken the lease of machinery alone, it would have been only 80. If I would have taken operation and maintenance of machinery separately, then it would have been 40. So 80 plus 40 would have been 120, but now the consideration is only 100. So what is the contract value which I have to take? I will have to take contract value 100 which is split between 80 is to 40 ratio that is 2 is to 1 ratio. Clear? This is the basic common sense logic which I will apply in standalone selling price. Now someone can use this word standalone selling prices and someone can refer back. I want the comment section where did you see this word standalone selling price? This word standalone selling price does come under Another standard, anyone who can tell me, I am waiting for you in the comment section, check the comments, I am checking the comments, tell me where else did you have this word standalone selling price. This word standalone selling price appears under Indias 115. Where under Indias 115? In my step 4. What is the step 4 after determination of transaction price in step 3 comes your step 4 where I will allocate a fantastic man so many people yeah someone uh, Mannin Yamuna again you have given PPE PPE is the right answer where you have consolidated consideration I'll come I was about to say that but I was talking about India's 115 allocate Transaction price to each performance obligation.
Yes, guys. So this was our India's one on fight where we did get it. Yeah, someone who has given the comment section the answer is PPE. Absolutely right. Even under PPE, if you remember where we were talking about determination of cost of the asset, where we say if I have purchased multiple assets in a single transaction, then the consideration which is paid under the contract should be split between to each asset which is purchased in that combined in the entire contract based on their standalone selling price. Same logic we have there, same logic we have here. But there, we don't use standalone selling price, we use fair value. Okay, this word standalone selling price was not used in property, plant and equipment, but logic is pretty much the same. So I am using the standalone selling price or I picked up this word of standalone selling price from India's 115 only. Now all those are somewhere, someone who gave Rakesh Naidu 113, I have no idea, man, 113 from where did you get it? Because I have never seen it on standalone selling price in 113. Okay, oh, anyway, it's fine. Now, let's talk about a few small, small parts before I go into the recognition and measurement parts. Before I go into the concepts of recognition and measurement, let's try to discuss about a few small aspects. They are not so substantially big concepts at all. So the first thing which I will talk about is combination of contracts. When do you combine contracts? I might have entered into a lease of 100 vehicles. I am not entering into a lease of one vehicle. I entered into a lease for 100 vehicles. Now question comes up, sir, each vehicle is one lease or 100 vehicles put together is one lease? Logic same man. In days 115 also you have a similar logic, whether I can combine the contracts or should I treat it as segregation or separate contracts. Heading is called a segregation and combination of contracts under in days 115. Here also very similar thing where we are talking about combination of contract, whether it is possible or not. Same logics, number one. If it is as per, you have, you have basically negotiated it as a single package. I did not negotiate one vehicle at each point of time. All 100 vehicles put together are one single package I negotiated. Number two, it is not possible for me to take only a part of the contract. Either I have to take full contract of 100 vehicles or I have to leave. I cannot say I'll give you 20, I'll give you 50. That is not possible. So it is not possible for me to take it up in parts and that, that, that means the 100% I have to basically deal with one single contract. Number three, the price and performance of one contract is dependent upon the price and performance of another contract. Obviously, if I make a mistake in one vehicle, he is going to basically screw me up for all the 100 vehicles because for him it is one single package. For me, probably it is 100 vehicles. But for him, he has negotiated it in one single package itself. So basically, whenever we are talking about such kind of a things, we, if these are thing, uh, things which are satisfied, then you can combine all the 100 vehicles into one single contract. Clear? What is a lease term? Very important and very interesting uh, logics which come up here is what is lease term? To explain this concept of lease term, I'll bring in three parts. First one, it is a non cancellable period under the lease. This is the first part. Plus, the extended period. If it is reasonably certain, minus termination period. If it is reasonably certain.
let's say the lease term is for five years first three years is non cancellable lease you have to compulsory use it for the entire three years period of time after three years after three years I am giving a right to the lessee lessee can cancel or terminate the lease on specific intimation now if it is reasonably certain that he will terminate the lease then I will consider the lease period as only three years by applying a deduction which I have already applied here where I said minus termination period. Lease period can be taken as even the extended period. Lease term is five years old. But the lease can be extended for further three years at the option of the lessee and it is reasonably certain that he will exercise the option. In such cases, I will take the lease term as eight years. If there is no reasonable certainty, I will only stick to non-cancellable period. I will not go beyond that. Now, what is non-cancellable period? Non-cancellable period means either of the party, either of the party cannot cancel the lease. Either of the party means either the lessee or the lessor or in the language that we have been using so far, the seller and the customer, neither of them can unilaterally cancel the lease without the intimation to another party and without compensating him for the damages. Clear? I cannot cancel the lease without intimating the other party. Number two, even if I have a right to cancel the lease, I have to pay significant damages to the other party. If I am not paying significant damages to the other party, then I will not be considering it as a part of my non-cancellable period at all. Clear? So, this is basically what we can talk about as far as the logics of lease are concerned. I haven't touched the recognition and measurement part. Observe where we are. We have started with the concept starting from leases and what is the exemption from scope. Recognition exemptions for low value items and short term, short -term leases. And from there we went on to identify what is ROU asset which is the only distinguishment or difference between India 17 and India 116. Then you can identify a lease. What are the three components which are necessary to identify a lease? First of all, you have to identify an asset and the customer or the lessee has a right to substantially obtain all the economic benefits from the use of the asset and he has a right to control the use of the asset or direct the use of the asset on how it can be used and for what purpose it can be used. We have broken down each part and explained everything. We have gone into combination of contracts and explaining what is a lease. With that, we come to the end of the first part of the standard where we understood the basics of the standard. From here on, we will start discussing only about the concept of recognition and measurement. From here, we will only discuss about the concepts of recognition and measurement. That is the predominant part in the standard. So guys, we can take a break for 10 minutes. I'll write, see you back once in another 10 minutes, guys. I'll just see you back in 10 minutes time, guys. We'll finish it off all the all the Recognition and measurement, I'll finish it off in 10 minutes time. We can take a break for 10 minutes. We can come back in 10 minutes time.